This Lovely. conference, this conference will now be recorded. Perfect. So we're now being recorded. And uh, yeah, I, I think with with the uh, action items we have, if we don't have a quorum and we cannot actually approve the action item, it will not be a showstopper. So uh, let's go ahead and proceed. And Leah, you're on, I think. Okay, great. Um, I am going to open with the statement that due to the nature of the declaration of a state of emergency due to novel coronavirus, COVID-19, pursuant to code 2.2-3708.2, this meeting is to be held by electronic communications via the web platform GoToMeeting. The catastrophic nature of this declared emergency makes it impracticable and unsafe to assemble a quorum in a single location. And the purpose of this meeting is to discuss or transact the business statutorily required or necessary to continue operations of the public body. Okay, I'll call the meeting to order. Great. And Lee, if you do roll call. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening, CTAC members. I'm going to conduct roll call. You might want to take a moment right now to unmute your mic so that you're ready when I call your name and you're not fumbling with it when I do. And I miss you. Okay, starting with the city of Fredericksburg and our chair, Mr. David McLaughlin. Present. Mr. Joshua Brock. Present. Mr. John Castellaran. Here. Mr. Math Matthew Rowe. Mr. Alfred Durant. Here. Mr. Neil Holleran. Mr. Stan Huey. Mr. John Josh Templeton. Mr. Anton Stubbs. For Stafford County, Mr. Melvin Allen Sr. Mr. David Swan. Here. Ms. Ethelin, Ethelian Crenshaw. Mr. Glenn Goldsmith. Mr. Timothy Haddix. Mr. Wade Sudreth. Here. For King George County, Ms. Leslie Jordan. Dr. Robert Gates. Here. For Caroline County, Mr. Ken Pogue. Mr. Michael Ho Hoyt. Mr. Justin Chenault. At large members, Mr. Larry Gross. Here. Mr. Rupert Farley. And Mr. Dustin Savage. Here. Thank you. And I believe that you do have a quorum just because uh, votes are taken by who is present. Excellent. So there was more people uh, online that I didn't realize. It's just basically looking at the go-to meeting and how many uh, little pop-ups there are for. It. Now there is one person who is just. As G for guests, do we know who that is? That'd be hard to describe, but I don't know. Um, maybe we won't, but maybe they'll speak later on. So, okay. Uh, well, that's great. We have a quorum, so good. So now we need to uh, we need to uh, approve the agenda. Is, does anybody need to make any changes to the agenda? Uh, item three here. Okay. Uh, can I get a motion to approve the agenda? Say your name, please. Moved. Al, so moved. Second, say your name. I'll second it, John Castellaren. Thank you. Is there anybody opposed to this uh, agenda as uh, that we have in front of us? Okay, hearing none, uh, I'll, we'll proceed that uh, by consensus the, the agenda is approved. Um, now we need to approve the uh, meeting minutes, and there may be uh, you know, really three for three responses in this case. It would be uh, agree, approve, or nay, I don't approve, 
and with changes, or thirdly, I was staying because I wasn't present at that meeting and uh, Endor was not able to review it electronically, uh, which is actually quite a benefit. Now, in the old days, if you weren't at the meeting, um, you missed it entirely. Now you can actually go back and see the entire meeting and then could uh, approve it, which is kind of a nice thing. So, um, so uh, I assume we're going to assume everyone has an opportunity to see the uh, meeting minutes. Are there any changes that anyone is aware of that uh, need to be called out? Because then we can approve the minutes as amended. Okay, I don't hear any. Uh, then I'll again call for a motion to approve the minutes from the uh, the last meeting, uh, July 15th. What name, please? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. John Castellaren. Thank you, John. Uh, motion, uh, second. Uh, Rob Gates, I'll second it. Thank you. Is there anybody opposed to the minutes as they've been published and uh, promulgated? Okay, hearing none, I'll assume the rest are in favor of the minutes and the minutes from the last meeting are approved. Thank you. Okay, Adam is gonna give us a review of July and August policy committee meetings. There's a lot of material there, Adam. <laughs> there certainly was, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the agendas from both of those meetings so that everybody who was not in attendance has a general idea of some of the updates that I give here, if that's all right. Yes. So a couple highlights from our July and August policy committee meetings. Um, we do, of course, with the new fiscal year, have a new slate of officers. So we do have Ms. Shelton from Stafford County, who is now the chair of the SAMHSA policy committee. Um, in July, the CMAC and STBG slash RSTP funds that were, um, they were allocated in accordance with the TAC recommendation, uh, with the exception of the STBG funds going to Telegraph Road that was effectively put on hold for Stafford County to have further discussions with VDOT. Um, we gave a presentation both to the GWRC board and the FAMPO Policy Committee related to an idea around 5307 and CMAX funding opportunities. And we will actually touch base on that tonight here at the CTAC meeting. And we kind of went over roles and responsibilities of both boards and outlined the process. The policy committee, we asked them if they wanted to direct us as a staff to hold a call for projects, which is one of the steps involved in the SAMPO responsibilities. And they effectively uh, asked us to take the discussion back to the TAC to further define parameters for what projects they wanted to consider. Um, so again, we'll talk about that more in detail here on a later agenda item. We did get our LRTP amendment to the 2045 LRTP approved. Um, I forget if that was the July or the August meeting. I might have the wrong agenda up here. That might have been in July. And then the Associated Air Quality Conformity Analysis Report. Um, so that was largely administrative by that point. It had been on hold for a while due to the pandemic. Um, we also, in August, had our George Washington Transportation Opportunities for Economic Growth Report approved by the Policy Committee, um, as well as the Smart Scale Resolutions of Support. Um, I will point out that one of the responsibilities of SAMPO is to uh, approve their own uh, projects, as well as any from the GWRC that are within the SAMPO boundaries of Spotsylvania, the city, and Stafford County. And then they're asked to endorse projects from localities, so from those three localities. I will point out that there was one project from the city of Fredericksburg, their local list, um, that was dropped. There was a motion made to drop one of their local projects and that motion did carry. Um, so that, uh, Mr. Chair, is a quick highlight from the July and August policy committee meetings. Okay, and you, you made it sound very matter of fact about that one project not being endorsed by the uh, entire FAMPO policy committee. Um, that, that was contentious. The city of Fredericksburg said this is, uh, it has no uh, precedence that uh, this has always been endorsed. 
in fact it will never it doesn't really uh, preclude the city to continuing and they will to submit that project as part of one of their smart scale project applications and it was kind of a like you have just opened the door now we can start picking and you know taking pot shots at whatever one county or another or city or jurisdiction puts in uh, as a project for smart scale and so it was unfortunate to that that happened uh, but uh, anyway that's that's what it is now uh, Adam properly described it is what what fell out of it so um, all right um, now I'm looking at next okay um oh okay it's now time for uh public comment i know there have no been no uh written or uh you know emails or anything like that public comments submitted for this meeting in advance so there's none of those to be read by uh, leah for us um but if there's anyone who's dialed in uh like i say there's one person who comes across as guest who needs to make a comment uh, or uh, have questions from the members of the public, those are welcome at this time and only at this time. There will be no opportunity for you to speak later on during discussions or action items. So is there anyone out there who would like to make a comment? Okay, no one out there. Having trouble going, getting your mic on? All right, hearing none. Um, I will uh, close the public comment at this point. Um, are we at seven? Seven eight. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Seven eight discussion items. Uh, Adam is going to discuss uh, CMAC and uh, STBG RSTP. The All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the first discussion item that we have before the committee tonight is an update that's taking place to the existing CMAC and STBG slash RSTP prioritization methodology. So um, every year um, there is a new pot of funding that comes to the region that is the responsibility of the policy committee to allocate for the out year. So with the VDOT six year plan, uh, basically, what will take place this coming January, February, March will be allocations for FY27. So it's quite a bit out there. And they can also, of course, choose to reallocate funds that have previously been allocated for the midterm years, any, anything between now and FY27. So what this document spells out is basically uh, how we as a staff are kind of instructed to do that. So there's a number of federal requirements as far as um, ensuring that the funds that start with the federal government end up with the state and then are basically pushed forward to NPOs for allocation, that there's a certain process that we follow for how we allocate these funds. And it's been identified over, um, really, I'd say the last year and a half, where there's a number of opportunities for improvement for the process in this document, as well as some of the scoring metrics. Um, something that we noticed this year as a staff is that there's a number of subjective criteria uh, when it comes to scoring. So trying to identify whether something has an impact without it coming from, say, a data set where instead of, is it a one or a 10, it's a, is this good or is this bad, right? That type of thing. So there's a number of opportunities, again, that we've identified. And so we've spoken with our TAC leadership from our locality staff partners. And um, our TAC chair, Mr. Alex Oziak, a transportation planner in Stafford County, has uh, taken the initiative to set up a subcommittee to be responsible for, as a subset of the TAC, developing an update to this methodology. And part of what's been discussed to date is separating out CMAC and then STBG. And then just for those folks who might be a little bit newer, um, when we say STBG or RSTP, they're effectively one and the same. It used to just be RSTP, but with the FAST Act, um, it's now the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program it's a little bit separate from what used to be known as solely RSTP. So bear with me with the acronyms. Um, so the goal is over the course of the rest of the calendar year and potentially into um, early 2021, coming up with a um, new methodology that would be uh, approved by the TAC, would get CTAC kind of endorsement in the process and then go back before the Fanfoot Policy Committee. Um, so I, I wanted to point that out. Um, 
you know, for the record that the, the TAC is working proactively to update this. And part of why we wanted to include the existing methodology in the meeting packet tonight is we'd also like to ask the CTAC members for any input from um, the public's or from a citizen's perspective on this document. I think that um, there are a number of technical items in here, and I know that we like to try and stay away from that with this committee um, and stick to more policy-based items. However, uh, part of what we want to make sure this document achieves is it's clear, it's understandable, um, and virtually any type of user would be able to, to kind of go through it. So there's not necessarily a, a timeline there, but Mr. Chair, I think what we would ask from a staff perspective is if any CTAC members have a comment on this or would like to discuss this at all, um, to have that ready for the next CTAC meeting. Mm -hmm. Any any questions from uh, any of the members of CTAC on this? I think it's a good idea that we could look at it and see what we talk about it the uh, next go around. Uh, Adam, I would, I have, uh, well, I have a question and a, and maybe a suggestion. I, I think if we specifically sent this to each of the members of CTAC and said we were looking for input, that would be very helpful to encourage them to provide input on the document. Um, and I would also, are, are we going to do public outreach on this particular? It, it, it's a lot of detail and a lot of technical that maybe public wouldn't have much, but. Is this worth uh, doing public outreach for? That's a really good question. I think, so this is not one of the documents that is in our public participation plan that's required to go through a public comment period. That doesn't mean we can't do one though. Um, so um, <laughs> the, the short answer is, is we haven't planned on that, but we, we certainly could. And if that's something this committee would recommend, we would certainly listen to that. Well, we have to, we have to take in the reality of the staffing that you have and, and, uh, and this, you know, maybe a nice to have, a, but not uh, at this this year, maybe, or with the staffing you currently have, that was something we you can take on. And I wouldn't, uh, I would a certain, it'd be nice. I, I, I'd ask, I think, and I, I think the committee would probably agree with me. I just ask you to consider it. If you have the staffing, if you have the opportunity and could do it, then it would be helpful. Um, but by the same token, there probably would not be a whole lot of valuable input that would come in i'd be surprised if there was so uh kind of weigh the the cost benefit if you will from your staffing perspective um and i i think the committee will be would very pleased with whichever way you go we will support you whichever way you go. okay that sounds like a plan now i, I do have also one other question how much alignment is is there between this methodology and smart scale and should there be more alignment or does it really matter does it make it so easier that is, from a staffing perspective right that that is one of the, the the fundamental questions that has sort of come up which has necessitated an update for this document so um, in short, it's not as closely aligned as we'd like it to be. Part of that is because we switched from category A in smart scale down to category B. So we would like to more so align with category B factors now that we're in that group. Um, so it's a really good question. That's exactly what we've been talking about. So um, we do want to have, and let me go ahead and scroll, Mr. Chair. So here's, well, wait a second. Um, so depending on the project type that's put forward for consideration of CMAC or STBG funding, it has its own set of criteria. Um, and so we would want some of these criteria to, to better align with, with smart scale, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anybody else have any questions, inputs? Okay. Thanks, Adam. Oh, and now the update. Carry on, Adam. <laughs> All right. I think this is my second of three, so I'll just carry right into the tip after this one, Mr. Chair, if that's all right. So this is a uh, quick update on the um, what I mentioned as far as the uh, discussion that took place at the Policy Committee and at the GWRC Board. So this is one of the so 5307 funding uh, starts with FTA and it's a new funding source for the region. So the GW Ride Connect uh, program, which is a transportation demand management program that's housed within GWRC, 
essentially generate 53 of seven funds for the region. Those funds go to PRTC, the uh, Potomac Rappahannock um, Transportation Commission, I believe is what the acronym is, and then um, eventually flow through via a subrecipient agreement, to GWRC, to then allocate 53 of seven funds. So historically, until 5307 was a reality for the region, FAMPO was wholly responsible for all of the regional pots of funding that get allocated for transportation purposes. So part of the what's been identified by some of our locality staff is a, uh, a, a more efficient way to use very scarce resources. So for those of you who were um, at Paul's presentation last week for the CTEC educational session, we talked a little bit about this idea. And so what we tried to do, and, and this is a largely adapted presentation from July and August for our, our, our boards, um, but basically what this spells out is what the GWRC role is as far as um, how they're required to allocate 53 to 7 funds, and then from a SAMPO perspective, what the different steps are in the process. So it's not as simple as it's, it's possible you've heard this referred to as a swap idea in the past. I know dating back to 2018, for those of you who were here at that point, there was an idea of a 53 of 7 CMAX swap. It's not quite as, as cut and dry as that. Part of that is because anything that SAMPO allocates for CMAC has to go through that prioritization methodology that we were just taking a look at. So the idea is to take projects that have existing CMAC funds and put 53 of 7 funding in, in its place, which would free up CMAC that could then go to anywhere else the policy committee so decides. And so in doing that, one of the steps in the process is to um, initiate a call for projects. So that's the step where we were in July, and again, when I mentioned in my update from the policy committee, they basically said we need to better define what parameters we want to use in this call for projects. And so what they essentially gave us direction to do is go back to the TAC, and I'm going to go ahead and scroll to another slide here. I think I'm talking a little bit out of order here. Um, they asked us to go back to the TAC and say um, we don't want to consider funding directly to transit agencies. We just want to consider funding for localities. So that's not to say localities couldn't place funding on a VRE project or a FRED project. It's just VRE and FRED and PRTC wouldn't be part of this overarching call for projects. It would be two projects per locality, um, and they would have to be smart scale candidate projects. So that's what the TAC recommended last week in their September 8th meeting. And so that's effectively where things are at right now so that when we meet with our policy committee on Monday, we're going to ask is, you know, essentially, would you like to move forward with what TAC has recommended where we're not exactly sure what the overall pot of funding is going to be because we're not sure at this point what amount of funding the GWRC board is going to want to allocate for 5307. But regardless, we need to do a call for projects so that we have a, a list of projects lined up that our staff will then score and rank so that whether it's a million dollars or $5 million or whatever the amount is, we can say, here's how we'd like that to go. And then the policy committee can make that decision. So I know that's a little bit long-winded and there's a lot of moving pieces, but that's kind of where we're at right now with this process. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Al, go ahead. Uh, Adam, could you talk a little bit more about <clears throat> Uh, 5307 funding specifically, uh, where it comes from, actual amounts, how it compares to CMAC funding? Good. Sure. I, I think we have a little bit about that here. So, Al, I'll, I'll be honest, I am not the foremost expert on 5307 funding, and I would encourage um, you as well as the rest of the committee. Um, we are having a gentleman from DRPT present to the FAMPO board on Monday night who is um, a, a much more so well-versed expert in 5307. But with that being said, um, Al, what we tried to do with this slide with background is um, give a little bit of a, again, a high-level overview of how the 5307 funds make it to our region. So the Van Pool Alliance is the group where, and I'm going to mince words here a little bit, but th they're basically a group that GWRI Connect, I believe, is kind of a part of. And in being a part of that Van Pool Alliance, um, that's the mechanism by which, based on the metrics and the efficiency of that program in getting people out of their single occupant vehicles, um, generate 53 to 7 funding that the region can then take and invest in transit projects throughout the region. So 
Um, let me look here. If there's anything that I missed. So I, I think that that is, is largely, Al, the extent of, of my knowledge with 5307, but it's something that operates independently of FAMPO, at least, um, at least right now. That's, that's the process that's set up. So is this money that the Vanpool owners contribute to be part of the consortium or the alliance? Or does this money come from somewhere else to sort of mitigate uh, traffic issues and, and pollution issues? Or do you know? That's kind of the idea. It's, it's essentially an incentive program where for regions that operate a transportation demand management program, such as GW Ride Connect, the added value that a program like that provides to the region, sort of as a, you're doing a really good job, keep it up. FTA will then say, we're going to give our recipients based on how well those programs perform. Basically, how many people are they keeping out of their single occupant vehicles? They're getting into a van pool. They're getting into a slug line. They're taking transit, that type of thing, almost as a reward saying, you've operated at such a high clip. You're a very efficient program. Um, so to, to your question, sorry, this is the one I missed about funding amounts. I believe that in the fiscal years to date, where there has been 53 of seven allocations in the region, I want to say it's somewhere in the range of $1.2 million a year. So in the big picture of transportation, it's not a huge ocean of funding out there that we're just tapping into. It's, it's a relatively small amount. Um, but like I said, it is, a, it is a new funding source for the region now that GWI Connect is part of the Vanpool Alliance. I mean, the reason I ask, and I don't want to keep like beating a dead horse, but the reason I ask is uh, it seems to be in certain areas, um, certain municipalities, there's a lot of pushback against the Vanpool Alliance. Like it's a, it's not a money maker. Why are we doing this? You know, we should do away with it. And what, you know, why are we funding, you know, independent businesses and so I'm, I'm just trying to kind of get an answer clear in my head about what people are talking about or not talking about as the case may be. Sure. And, and I think what, what, you know, what we can do, Al, is um, GWR Acting Act put together an FY21 work plan that I know was presented toward the end of the last fiscal year. I think that would probably spell out in more detail um, and a lot better than I can what, what we're trying to get at here. So we can distribute that to the CPAC after the meeting so that everybody else can, can take a look at that um, as well. That'd probably be good. I think there's just some potential misinformation floating around out there. Sure. Yeah. Al, Al those, are, those are really good points, you know, because, you know, when I sit on the PC and you have too, so you, you're seeing this and then the TAC and, you know, you have GW Ride Connect comes under GWRC, second bullet there, not FAMPO. And so you have that right. ongoing controversy about, you know, what's FAMPO's transportation, GWRC. And so you get into that and who controls it. And then uh, Adam, Adam said something about the ocean. The ocean wasn't very big, the, the amount of money here, but there, it's blood. It's blood in the water, and the sharks are saying, how can we use this money to get more? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> how they, so it's, it's been very, very interesting to follow. Uh, and then you have, and so it'd be interesting to have PRTC, who the money comes down from the F, from the way I said, from, through them to GWR, to support GWR, Right Connect, and GWRC. And, um, and they have a different perspective on what it can be spent for and what it can't be spent. So sorting all that out has been going on, as, as Al, you've observed for almost three months now, probably. So uh, it's, it's been a, if we didn't have anything else during COVID, we got to discuss uh, 5307 a lot. So it was, it's been interesting. If I can make a question. Go ahead. So uh, Adam, just, so the 5307 funds, that's a federal program, correct? That gets awarded based on the activities of what GWRC is doing with this Vample Alliance. Is that, so it's, it's a pot of federal money that gets put based on uh, you meet a certain metric and you get, a, like you said, like an award, a reward for doing a job. What's the benefit of swapping these funds of GWRC is in control of those funds 
and there has to be an MOU between FAMPO and them to swap these funds? Or what's the benefit to FAMPO, who does not directly benefit from 5307, to swap these funds out? Is there, I mean, is it more of a benefit just of what, basically to spread the money around, or is it more of a, it makes it easier for some programs to get, uh, to be, uh, to, programs to be gone through CMAC are a little easier for FAMPO to do versus 5307? Like what would be the benefit of being able to swap these funds out? Yeah, Dustin, what you touched on there at the end of your question is exactly it. So there's a, a couple differing viewpoints, but the primary reason there is that some funding sources are more restrictive than others. So CMAC tends to be a, a relatively um, restrictive funding program. 5307 isn't restrictive in the same sense, but it's primarily focused on transit capital. So there's a 150-page FTA circular that spells out all of the ins and outs of how this works and um, DRPT has to sign off on projects that have 5307. PRTC has to effectively endorse it since they're the initial owner of the funds that come from FTA that then go to GWRC. But that's the idea is that you want to use the right pot of funding in the right place so that you make the most efficient use of funds year after year. Because again, when, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you were here for Paul's presentation last week, but there's only so much money every year to go around. And it's saying essentially what this question is getting at and this whole idea of the, of the again, I don't want to call it a swap, but placing 5307 on projects that have CMAC is taking a, a more restrictive funding source and applying it in, in a narrow sense. And then for the broader sources, um, freeing those up so that they can go again to projects that wouldn't quite fit the requirements for a more restrictive program. Okay, thank you. Let me editorialize for a minute, if I may. Uh, first of all, those uh, both of the, all those questions were excellent. They were on the mark, uh, getting to to what the real issues are, and the answers were even more uh, exceptional. So, but for some of the CTAC members who are really concerned about not all these nuances of where the money comes from and why you can swap this money and for that money and what the restrictions and everything are. Um, we all understand that we get that and and so don't get lost in the in the sauce if you will uh because you're here to say what's what can we do for the constituents in our the 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 citizens in the in the area that we represent what can we do to make sure that they get their transportation requirements and their needs addressed in the best way we can and so um Anytime these questions get a little bit too technical, please, I ask you to say, wait a minute, let me, how does this boil down to it at my level? Um, and, and, and that's what we're here to do because we're representing the citizens. Citizens are di dialing into this. Um, and, uh, you know, the TAC committee has their technical expertise and di deals into more level of detail. So, um, so this, I mean, it's great dis discussion. Uh, it's really, it was really covered very, very well. Um, and I don't want to uh, exclude anybody or turn anybody else off if we get too much into details. But this, these details are pretty hot topics right now at the policy committee where they actually make these decisions and, and spend the money. So um, how we can feed those discussions and make our input known to them is very, very important to uh, to all of us on this committee. So. Um, anyway, soapbox. Thanks. I'm going to get on my soapbox too. Then <laughs> um, it's been my experience. Uh, I'm also on the Spotsy Transportation Committee, so I, I see how that works also, and so I'm getting information from both ends. Um, and it seems like often and i'm not going to just say it's spots yeah I, I mean because it's i see it in in the, the policy committee too often people um from municipalities are just like interested in getting the money and using it any any well, i'm getting i mean it's this isn't going to sound that but using it any way they can rather than using money in a way that most benefits the citizens sometimes I, I i just get the feeling that that there's a possibility of that happening let me put it that way to sort of 
try to be a little more diplomatic about it. So, I mean, that's my concern about anything like swapping or, you know, that it, it is still, I mean, there's a reason that certain funds aren't, um, aren't to be used for certain things. And, and so, you know, when you start, start to, I, I, and there may be nothing wrong with, with it, but that's why I'd, I like, you know, I'd like to have the information or why I'm asking some of the questions I'm asking. Uh, totally agree with you, Al. It's, it's, you're right. And so we, what we can do as, as representative citizens uh, to provide a, maybe a balance to that, those discussions or a different perspective and input is, is huge. And, and, and so, uh, Thank you for that, Al. You're absolutely right. And anyone else on this subject? Okay, Adam Tip. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll go ahead and go to the next item here. Um, this is a little bit drier and not quite as uh, contentious. I'll put it that way. Um, just a quick update on our, our TIP, which is still scheduled to be implemented uh, October 1st. So the TIP, for those of uh, you who are newer, the Transportation Improvement Program is the acronym. And basically, it is the four-year short-term plan that outlines all of the programming for projects that are either regionally significant or receive federal funding. And in most cases, it's sort of both and. So that's what the uh, the tip is, and uh, two things to touch on here. So one is the Public Transportation Safety Plan, or PTAST, and this is the final transit-related transit performance measure for MAP 21 and the FAST Act. So essentially, FAMPO is going to be required to add um, new targets as far as safety goes to our new tip once implemented by February of 2021. So this is for any uh, MPO that has a tier two transit agency within its MPO. So FRED is a tier two transit agency in Virginia. Um, again, I won't get too far in the weeds here, but basically what this is, is the state has set targets for um, some of these metrics, fatalities, injuries, safety events, and system reliability, wanting to make sure that all of those are trending in the right direction. So we have to add language and targets to our tip. So that is forthcoming and will be part of an amendment once the new tip is implemented. Um, speaking of that, the other item here at the bottom, so this is actually two separate documents, but I included them together in the meeting packet. The uh, STIP development and the rollover process. So the STIP is the sum of all of the MPO tips as well as other rural projects that make up the statewide transportation improvement program. Um, it too starts with the federal fiscal year, October 1st, and there's a rollover process where any action that any MPO took on its own tip from August of 2019 to September of 2020. So any amendments or any modifications uh, that were made to the tip um, effectively get rolled over into the FY21-24 tip. So again, it's a relatively kind of cut and dry thing. Um, so we'll have an amendment before the TAC, the CTAC, and then of course the policy committee, um, likely in November, potentially in January. So again, just wanted to update the committee on those couple items, and that's all I have for this, Mr. Chair. Any questions from the committee? Anybody on the committee? Okay, uh, hearing none, then we can. Oh, Al's got one. Go ahead. Sorry, Al. Unmute myself. Uh, it's just something, and you may not know this, Adam, but uh, let's say pick like a two year period or whatever. I mean, I know that this is basically using mass transit to alleviate uh, injuries and fatalities, say on I 95 or, you know, just on the road in, in uh, passenger cars. But uh, have there been instances of injuries involving mass transit in the area? That is a really good question. Um, Al, as just, somebody just, else presents, well, well I was going to say, the, the short answer is I'm not really sure. Um, I know that data is out there. And I, I think I actually have an email that would have a data set with that. So I was going to say, if somebody else presents tonight on a further agenda item, I'll see if I can find my email and, and circle back to that. But the short answer is, um, that's okay. I mean, I, 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 I'm not really sure. That's okay. I mean, if you want to 
you know, send it out later if you find it or not bother. I was just curious if, you know, I feel something like that might stand out, you know, three people were killed sure. on our buses or something, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I'm sure there are people who, you know, fall down the stairs or whatever. So, but just curious. Yeah, given the state of mass transit in our region, given that it's not extremely pre you know, prevalent, it, it right. would probably be front page news and we would all know about it right away. <laughs> and it, would, it would ring a bell even if it was three years ago. So I, I don't think there's been any fatalities on our transit system, but um, <laughs> okay. I will take a look at the, at the data set and get back to you, Al. Thanks. Yeah, all the all the things that jump to mind for me are like the you know someone gets killed by a train or something you know, but it's not that's not what you're talking about at all. But I can't think of the big uh, scenarios now. I I can't think of one of the big catastrophes. So. Okay, any uh, any other questions or inputs from anybody on the on that update? Okay, uh, we're gonna have a little bit of update on uh, smart scale round four, and then there will be a resolution uh, that we will have to take action on. Yep, so I hope everyone is doing well tonight. Um, so as you all probably know, the deadline passed for smart scale in August. So GWRC and FAMPO each submitted uh, four applications. So they decided uh, which of the applications to drop from their list. Um, I believe the FAMPA list was the I-95 to exit 130 to exit 126 southbound improvements was dropped. And then on the GDRRC list, um, I believe it was the US-1 and Leho Road improvements, which was also dropped. Um, so the other applications for GDRRC were the US-17 uh, business intersection and pedestrian improvements, US-1 turn lane extension and shared use path. Anvil Road improvements, and in US 301, Route 207 study crossover improvements uh, in King George County. Um, and then on the FAMPO list, uh, in Spotsylvania County, Route 208 operational multimodal improvements, Exit 126 STARS study and uh, multimodal improvements, uh, Garrisonville Road widening in Stafford County, uh, and then Lafayette Boulevard multimodal improvements in the city of Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania County. Um, and then with that, we also have a resolution here, kind of um, this resolution is just to say that we um, support these three projects and that they will be added to uh, our CLRP and will be added in the, the 2050 LRTP. Um, and the three projects are the Lafayette Boulevard multimodal improvements, the Route 28 operational and multimodal improvements, and the US-1 turn lane extension and shared use path at Forest and Woods. So these three projects are not currently in the CLRP, but we will be adding them and this is just to show that currently while they're not in there we do support them and that they will be added if anyone has any questions i'm, I'm happy to answer anything else so so to summarize all three of these were were on the list that have been approved and yes. uh, by by the P policy committee to go forward as uh, and have the endorsement of dwrc and fampo it's yep. just that because they were not on the the 2045, we want to we, we kind of make a statement that hey, they're not on 2045, but they're they're going to be on the 2050, and we and they they meet all the criteria that should be considered. Is that exactly? Kind of yep, that is that is exactly the case. We kind of just want to make sure we check every single box possible, and that we aren't missing anything. Um, this is not a specifically required resolution, but we want to make sure we check every single box, and that we're we, we get everything right for this process. Yeah, that was that was good, Matt. That was uh, so. Um, so if you think about these things, have been already approved and endorsed at the PC level, and it's kind of a, a follow up, uh, almost administrative endorsement of them, or, or uh, a clarification of, of their uh, legitimacy, if you will. So, um, is there a discussion on this? Hey, Dave, Dave Swan, can you scroll down just a little bit? Thank you. Okay, could, uh, is there a motion to approve this resolution?
Okay. Dave, uh, Dave Swan, I'll make a motion to approve this resolution. This is Neil Holler, and I'll second it. I've been on the phone since about 612, everybody, just for Leah's roll call. Sorry about that. Oh, good, Neil. Thanks. That's great. great. Glad you're here, or have been here, I should say. Um, okay. Uh, is there any discussion of this? Any is it clear in everybody's mind what we're trying to do here? It's, okay. Hearing no discussion, then. Uh, is there anyone opposed to this resolution? Is there anyone who wants to abstain from this resolution? Okay, then I'm going to assume that everyone else is in favor of the resolution and the resolution passes. Thank you. Okay, now this will be very interesting. I think when we move to the uh, LR, the Long Range Transportation Plan, and I mean, you, you think about this plan. Okay, it's coming up, and now it carries over. Okay, we've done this in 2020 and 2030 and 2045, and blah blah blah. But now we're entering this new Long Range Transportation Plan with the result of COVID and more people working from home and less people trans, uh, you know, using using the interstate to get to offices up in the, in the north and everything. So some of the basic assumptions that have gone into this plans in the previous years, where we would assume there'd just be more and more people traveling up north from uh, from the south, for example, and I'm, I'm exaggerating, obviously, and getting a little, but um, this is gonna be very interesting, the assumptions that go into this basic plan, how much are they gonna change based on what we've learned now and what we can project uh, estimate or guess is going to happen uh, in the future as far as people working from home and not commuting and what does that do to the plan. So um, I think this one's going to be a little more interesting than just rolling over the previous estimates. Okay, we've had, you know, we've had growth in the south and southern Virginia and therefore there's going to be more people that are going to be on the highways going north and coming home and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I, I think this one is going to be interesting. So I'm looking forward to uh, the process we're about to enter into, which is Adam. Adam is going to tell us about. So Adam, thank you. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that's very well said. Um, so there's a couple things we wanted to touch base on um, with the CTAC as far as the development of the 2050 Long Range Plan. Um, I, so this is uh, this is essentially our, our team's kind of major work effort for FY21. So we're we're taking on quite a bit in house. I think much more so than what's um, been done historically. And the goal is to have this completed by the end of calendar year 21. So the LRTP for those of you who have been around was put on hold in December of 2019 once uh, both Paul and, and Mark left Fanpo. And so we have put together a work plan in coordination with the TAC over the summer to basically pick the effort up uh, where it left off and drive forward to completion. So what this document does is it highlights some of what's been done to date. Um, so, I, you know, I'm not going to read through each of these things here. It sort of talks through, um, again, where things left off in December of 2019 as far as what's been completed. And then it gets into the major buckets of work that we're going to be completing both as a FAMPO staff internally and then with our consultant, Cambridge Systematics. And so we've also included at the end of this document the task order that we have in place with Cambridge for their assistance. And so their big heavy lift is going to be around the modeling work that's associated with the universe of projects that we have for the 2050 document. Um, we do also have, and I talked a little bit about this with the chair as we went over the agenda, um, a pretty robust uh, public involvement initiative that we're looking to undertake for this document. Part of what we want to be sure we avoid, that we didn't quite have the luxury just due to timing constraints over the last six or seven months due to a relatively um, uh, uh, short staff that we've had, is uh, we want to have an iterative process with sort of feedback from um, the CTAC and then the public at large as well. So what we're trying to do is from the start um, put put together um, information, documentation, narrative, maps, that as we develop some of the goals and objectives for the region for the next 30 years, it's, it, it has the public's kind of uh, input from the start rather than we get to the very end and we have a 500 page document and we say, we have a public comment period, give us your input. So we wanna avoid that and 
get input um, as we go. So each month at the CTAC meeting, you'll you'll hear from us as far as um, asking for input on some of the different items that we're working on with the LRTP. And again, um, like I mentioned, the uh, statement of work for the task order with Cambridge is in this document as well for anyone who's interested in reading that. And so if it's okay with the chair, I will jump down here to um, the two subheadings related to the LRTP. And the first is CTAC representation on our working group. So what we asked for at the TAC meeting last month, or last week rather, was to establish kind of an informal uh, working group where any staff that make up the TAC who have an interest in providing more detailed feedback and guidance to our team as we work on some of the more um, finer points of the um, analysis that we conduct, the mapping that we do, that type of thing, um, who'd want to have sort of a standing monthly meeting to uh, go through things on a more detailed, comprehensive level. Um, that's sort of the purpose of the working group. And so talked with the chair about the idea of having up to two CTAC members uh, be a part of that working group if there is interest. And so I would ask the chair if he'd like to entertain that idea and have that for discussion. No, I, I, I totally agree with the idea, but I will say one thing. So Adam said this is, you know, a monthly meeting. This isn't just, you can just sign on and say every once in a while I'm going to show up for this and on this working group. It's it's really going to take some commitment uh, if, if we only have two people. And you don't want to have a meeting that's too big. So if two people are going to represent all of CTAC, they really have to be committed to represent us uh, regularly and routinely. And so, um, but I hope we have those two people and the two right people to do that because I think it's, it's, it's wonderful. That's what... Uh, I, I think it's great that we're going to be a part of this uh, as it as it grows. So, um, so uh, I guess this will be. Um, I mean, obviously, anybody who's here on the meeting, we would, uh, if you will, submit your name uh, to Adam that you're interested in doing that, and then uh, there'll be one of the follow-up things from the meeting. That again, Leah, we're gonna we're, we're throwing a couple three things on you actually, uh, if you would. Uh, in this one follow-up email, say who would want to be, uh, who would like to nominate themselves to be representation, uh, represent CTAC on the working group, and there'll be a call for call for names from that. So, um, is, is there anybody who's online right now and says, yeah, you know, I'm really, I'm really excited about that. I'd, I'd like to do that. So uh, you can you can shout out or not. You don't have to if you want to. Okay, no worries. So we'll, we'll we'll put out a call for uh, interest on that, and uh, and 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 uh, we'll have a couple of uh, highly uh, motivated. And it's it's not just motivated, but the people obviously people have the time to do that. I mean, uh, some some people you know get they're very very busy, and so getting another working group may not be the best thing they can do right now. So. Um, do we know when this group will be meeting? Uh, people might you know, be able to commit or not commit, depending on. Yeah, that's a good question. Now, we, um, we, we, haven't, we haven't picked a definitive time. Um, we do have a couple of staff people. So um, Paul has offered um, to, to be on this working group as well as, well as Eric Nelson in the city. So it, it will be um, during business hours. I, I'm comfortable in saying that, but I'm not, not sure exactly what day of the week or what time. Paul and Noah, when you say Paul? Yes. Good, good question, Al. All right. Uh, branding, next. Great. So this is the other idea that we talked about briefly over the summer um, as far as uh, essentially a name for the document. So some NPOs like to keep it relatively cut and dry like we have done in the past and just call it the 2050 Long Range Transportation Plan. Um, what the uh, TPD is doing, so that's the NPO to our north, um, they're calling their 2045 plan Visualize 2045. Uh, Richmond is in the process of, of developing their 2045 plan and they're calling it Connect RVA 2045. And so part of what we wanted to do is get ideas and input from the CTAC as far as uh, branding ideas for how we might name our, our document. Um, I will say, too, that we have an intern who has started with us just yesterday who is a 
an expert with graphic design. And so um, she's going to work quite a bit with us on creating um, the visual components of the of the brand. So the the font, the colors, the style, that sort of thing. What you know, which which we do think is important in trying to communicate the vision of of the document. Um, but wanted to see if there's any ideas, not necessarily that have to be thrown out right now, but um, we would like anybody who has an idea for a name to um, at least submit those to our staff um, by the end of the month, if possible. And then we'll present that to the working group that we establish and then eventually to the policy committee for, for their sign off. Anybody got their thinking caps on right now? I had one good good move, Fredericksburg. That was mine. All right. Um, no, nothing on that. We'll look for inputs on that. Uh, we have an update on uh, another update on 2050 LRTP. This is the. This is the rural LRTP. Oh, rural, yes, 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 thanks. Okay, of course, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening, everyone. So for the rural long-range transportation plan, we are just in the final draft stage of the document. Um, we're just finishing basic grammar and text editing, and we're making the final determination on the environmental justice analysis, uh, which looks at um, Title VI populations um, and analyzing the project needs, the future needs, both highway and bike and pedestrian needs um, against the EJ population census tracks. And so what we have looked at so far in our research shows that the projects that we have planned in the rural localities are improvements and they're not any way sort of restricting or um, affecting negatively those populations. And so we're going to bring this to all the committee boards in October, and the final draft of the document will be presented to the GWRC board in October as well. And I can take any questions on that. I would think there's great interest from the uh, rural counties. Don't normally get to play as much or as to the same significance in the other LRTP. So this is great, I think. All right. Any any inputs, questions? Nope. All right. Um, annual report, Carrie. Uh, so Carrie's not here, Thanks. so I'll also be sharing that update. And Jordan, give me just one second. I'm going to go ahead and pull the link up. Okay, yeah. So this is our FAMPO FY20 annual report about all the work that we've completed on FAMPO. And if we scroll through, we'll start with public involvement. So throughout the year, we did eight press releases and had several public, public comment periods, both in person with um, the TIP and the air quality conformity analysis. And as we transitioned in the COVID world to virtual um, public comment, we did videos and online surveys for the 2045 LRTP amendment, air quality conformity, and the UPWP. And then we also uh, had basic website updates and then we targeted social media outreach. And we started live streaming all of our meetings due to, again, the COVID transition. And then as we scroll down to the next uh, slide on the presentation, we did a lot of outreach events. We conducted 17 in person at the various library branches throughout the region and raised awareness about what um, transportation planning was. And also just several public notices about all of our meetings and events on free and accessible calendars. And as Adam mentioned earlier, the tip, we created the FY 21 to 24 tip, which is a federally um, federal federal document that has federal funding, which is also fiscally constrained for the next four years of transportation projects. And that draft was approved in May by the policy committee, and we're looking that it will be approved federally in October 1st. And this is kind of an interactive map of all the projects that are in our region. And if you press the bottom button, 
um, to explore. You can explore what the map has in it. And then stop exploring again. We'll stop exploring. You can see all the different categories of projects we have. And then as we scroll down again, Matt just gave a brief update about Smart Scale. So the summary slide here just gives the project titles and then short descriptions. The ones in the goldish yellow color are the ones that were approved in the final version of Smart Scale applications. And then that gray one at the bottom was the one that was taken out um, from the pre-application. And then lastly, the Lafayette uh, multi-modal trans. Oh, yeah. Please. So what you just showed there for the smart scale, I wish we'd had that from when we first started talking about Scott smart scale, that little one, that little paragraph of what it really says, instead of saying root to eight operation of multiple, you know, that says, no, this, I mean, I wish that was just that one little paragraph. If we had had that would help somebody like me anyway visualize what this what this smart scale uh project really is all about just look at that i mean it's just you know 1.4 miles of garrisonville road between the intersection of such and such and uh gutters and curbs and it's a lot more than just okay garrisonville roading road widening uh you know route 610 for 1.4 miles uh wow <laughs> anyway I, i'm sorry it, it it really struck me that i wish we had had this conversation or that little bit of information, little additional information in the last couple of months when we've been talking about uh, smart scale. So anyway, sorry. Yeah, no worries. And we can definitely put a note for the future smart scale rounds to just have a brief description like that because we got um, descriptions similar to that at the, kind of the beginning of pre-application, but the descriptions weren't official until we did the final application. So even if they'll be edited, we can make sure to incorporate those descriptions in the future. And then lastly, the Lafayette Boulevard Transit Study looked to complete um, a multimodal analysis um, of improvements for the Lafayette Boulevard quarter. And it recommended transit improvements and increased transit connectivity between the quarter, the Lafayette Boulevard quarter, and the greater Fredericksburg um, Bampo region, um, especially looking at different uh, transit paths for the Fred bus. And that's the update I have for that. So I can take any questions for that as well. Thomas, questions? Anything we that should be on there that you thought of that isn't on there? That's, that's a test question. All right. Um, all right. OK, thank you. Thank you. uh bylaw updates thank you mr chair so this is just a quick update we wanted to keep this on the agenda to keep um to keep everybody aware that we are going to need to update the ctac bylaws to account for remote participation in light of COVID 19. so um, that was one of the items that uh, stacy fight our public involvement coordinator um had put had put together and sort of had a plan for so that's effectively been on on hold her position has been vacant she she departed sampo early august um and her position has been vacant since uh, october 4th so um we just wanted to keep this on the agenda to sort of keep it moving and um, we are hoping to have that position filled very shortly and we'll hopefully have this on the agenda for next month for action okay and so i would and throw out if if we're going to do an update to CTAC bylaws because of the, uh, you know, the remote participation COVID. I mean, I hate to say it, we it wasn't long ago, and many of you remember we we updated the CTAC bylaws, but we probably are opening the window to look at any other things we need to change or we should change in the bylaws. If we're going to make one update, why not look at the whole the whole document? So uh, uh, no rush, no uh, uh, big. Uh, you know, there's nothing that's un 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 unglued that what we're doing, but uh, we might as well look at the whole thing uh, if we're going to do it anyway. So, thanks, Adam. Okay. Now, are any questions sure. or any inputs on that? Okay. Uh, back educational session ideas. Yeah, so this is something that we talked about the other day, Mr. Chair, as far as um, 
having more sessions like we did last week. I think everybody really enjoyed hearing from Paul. I know I did. Um, and I think part of what we want to do is leverage a lot of the expertise that we have in the region. And uh, I got a note from Mr. Swan last week who asked us to um, think about having a, some of the county engineers come and present to the CTAC about the project development process, which I thought was a really good idea. So I think part of what we wanted to do tonight is see if there's any other ideas for hearing from experts in the region about transportation issues, policies, what have you. Um, and, and we would be more than happy as a staff to set those up. Anybody off the top of their head have something that uh, they'd like to know more about? Just a general concept. You don't even have to have specifics. All right. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, Paul did a great job. It was very informative. Uh, and, and we, uh, we, I think our record, our, our, our minutes should uh, reflect that we thank him, uh, publicly thank him for uh, helping us and educating us and giving us his perspective, uh, taking the time to do that. So thank you. Okay, calendar update. Okay, if you take a look at the 2021, the FY21 calendar, um, CTAC meets the second Wednesday of every month, um, but you all need to look at November and um, the 11th, that second Wednesday is Veterans Day. So we just need to decide if it's going to be Tuesday before or Thursday after, or you want to change it altogether. But where you don't necessarily have to take a vote, um, it would be really good to make a decision, right. preferably. I mean, I mean, we ought to, we ought to just put it on the shoulder of the of the Wednesday and just move it either Tuesday or Thursday, and make a whole lot of difference to me. But uh, uh, especially if people are working, what is there is there a preference there uh, to do it on the twelfth for some reason? Or anybody? I, have, I I would prefer a Tuesday because I do uh, maintenance activities uh, every Thursday. Excellent. That's good answer. Good input. Thanks. I, I like Tuesday. I'll uh, second Tuesday. This is Neil. Okay. Um, the movement between Wednesday and Tuesday shouldn't be that huge a, a, a dilemma. So, uh, all right. If nobody else has the input, we'll change it to uh, the November the 10th. Great. I will update that then. Thank you. And uh, correspondence. That is also me. Okay, so um, this is just a Freelance Star article on the effects of the pandemic on transportation. Uh, surprisingly, they think that uh, telework may increase kind of permanently. And um, and also, there were a few policy members who were quoted in this article. So it's there for your reading. And it's relevant to the discussion we had earlier about the 2050 LRT. Well, uh, this is Josh Brock. Um, Speaking as somebody who's spent most of the last six months inside, the moment I can, I'm going to go everywhere I want and haven't been able to go the last six months. So I I don't, it, it may result in increased telework, but I think most people are going to want to, to you know, reclaim the ability to go out uh, that they've given up over the last several months and maybe the next several months. So I think in all, it's probably going to be a wash. I mean, I, I haven't read the article. I don't know the data they're looking at, but if anybody if if the rest of the world is anything like me we're going to still need transportation in the future maybe more of it but but are you 
are you suggesting that they they'll they'll want to go out? I agree with that, but it's not uh, everybody has to go out at six thirty in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, and get to the office at eight thirty, and then come back at the same time. So maybe spread out a little bit more. What do you think, John? Maybe I mean, and I'm, I'm my bet is there's uh, going to be a temporary dip in in commuter traffic even after everybody comes back. But work is a very very social phenomenon. I mean, we've had the ability to do most of our work by by uh, teleworking for you know a couple of decades now, and we don't do it. In fact, we build more office space maybe than we ever have. So uh, my guess is after a sort of an unstable point, maybe the next couple of years, it'll be at least back to normal levels. Um, so I, I wouldn't, my thinking is I wouldn't count on a permanent change, but you might be able to save some money in the short term and, and maybe put it to other kinds of projects that'll have more long-term effects since you know roads aren't gonna be used as much and buses aren't gonna be used as much, that there might be an option there. But overall, I don't think you're gonna see a whole lot of change. Josh, it did say, I believe the article says it's only about a 10% increase on telework. Yeah, that sounds but about right. And, and I, I'd be surprised if that lasted more than a year, personally. I, not that I have any data that, that you know, they don't have, but just my, my gut instinct is to say, overall, you're, you're probably not going to see a major permanent change. This is a I mean, there could policy. be. There could be a... a a shift to telework. I I, uh, um, I don't think that every place is as prepared maybe as some places like Fredericksburg or, or more urban areas are. Um, but I don't see a real commitment from the um, community leaders to expand. And and you know this would be the time where uh, I would think that there would be a commitment because we obviously need more um, internet access uh, so that yeah. we can educate our children and actually bring you know businesses in and allow the people to allow people to actually uh, uh, tell work. I, I mean, this this whole crisis it definitely illustrates the need for you know greater rural internet access and and better reliability on on telecommuting platforms and things like that. But um, if you if you do in fact see a major uh, meaningful drop in the in the you know commuting aspect of transportation, my guess is it's not going to be the workforce that drives that. It's you know whether they want to or not, it's going to be the um, the companies or maybe some some government agencies who are looking to save money on transportation plans or looking to save money on office heating stuff like that. It, it's it's going to be driven in that respect, um, and so maybe you'll see it in that in that regard. But in terms of people's desire to go places, even for work, I, my bet is you're not people especially when they're working on something like to be around other people it's it's just human psychology i'd be surprised yeah. if we saw any kind of major shift that wasn't being driven from sort of a financial bottom line perspective yeah i hear a lot of people who are uh, currently being forced to telework uh really express some serious uh mental fatigue mm -hmm. due to the fact that you know they just can't leave the house. They don't see other people. They're, you know, basically in this box all day long. So it does, you know, there is that aspect to it, certainly. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of people's um, uh, major social outlay in their lives. Hey, Mr. Chair, this is Adam. Um, so I was going to mention this in just a minute. We do have a um, new intern who just started, Mohammed Khan, and I believe he has a comment, um, if that's okay, on, on the article here. Is it? Yes, absolutely. We'd love to hear that. Go ahead, Mohammed. Mohammed Khan speaking. Um, I, I was wondering a second what Al was saying because um, I read an article a few days ago where they were talking about how it was actually cheaper for a lot of companies in the long run, especially tech companies, um, where they were thinking about instead of having to rent an office space, for instance, in a place like New York or D.C., um, it would be much cheaper if you, everyone just worked from home. And so I think you're going to see that shift, not necessarily on a wide range, but you're going to see it more in major cities 
due to the fact that you don't really have to pay rent for everyone to come into an office. And even nowadays, you're seeing individuals are saying on LinkedIn, for instance, they're saying that when things do get back to normal, they would want to work from home some days, but then go to work other days. And then there's some offices that are saying that we'll have some people come in sometimes and then some people come in other times. So these are kind of like the shifts that I was seeing. And so I would generally agree with the fact that they would say that 10%, there'd be a 10% decrease in traffic overall, even after the pandemic. Well, I, I, I wonder, um, I think you're right in that at least some places will have a, a, a desire at least, I don't know if they'll ever actually do it, but a desire to, you're right, save on those kinds of costs by, by pushing uh, work outside of the office space. But I don't know off the top of my head if we're likely to see that work stay home or if we're likely to see that work move to coffee shops or libraries or park benches or, you know, anywhere. Now they're doing the whole uh, 5G in the park kind of thing. So it, it's possible we'll still see uh, a load on the transportation network but uh, it won't be going to workplaces. It'll be going to more recreational places. I, I don't know. That's the kind of thing we'd have to get some more actual data on or find some models that could predict such a thing. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if a 10% drop in uh, office work would correspond necessarily to a 10% drop in commuter traffic per se. I don't know. Right. And, well, and I mean, what, the other thing is, is that, I mean, even if you look at, for instance, in New York, they had a, they had a newspaper that was saying, sorry, like a news that basically was saying that people are starting to move out into the suburbs because of uh, the coronavirus as actually having like a second house. And a lot of people are actually preferring to live like out in the end of Long Island, for instance, or even farther away from the city. Since the, the thing was with cities is that you're only living there because it's easier to commute and it's, you know, quicker to commute as well. Your commute is not as long. But now people are realizing that they don't need that anymore. So, Brian, I was, I was actually, I was just going to comment on that uh, as a former New Yorker, certainly. Uh, you know that, yeah, this. I mean, it not only gives people the ability to stay off the road, but if people are truly able to, you know, tell telework, then you don't have to live in a place like New York City to work for a New York company. You don't have to pay New York rents. Uh, or any other, you know, major metropolitan area, and so yeah, I think it, it will be a shift in in maybe a working population eventually. And Mr. Chair, Dave Swan, could I say something here? Yes, yes, go ahead. I was looking at the agenda on the other. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll I'll be brief. Uh, which is unusual. <laughs> I agree with Al. He's right, and I'm a New Yorker too, except I'm not a former, I'm still one. Uh, there are a lot of reasons people are moving out of New York City, by the way, and it's not good. But anyway, uh, uh, staying away from that, I can tell you the company I work for, which is a large, uh, I work for a small portion of a large company, and the company is based in the health services industry and it is finding and it is communicating with us, uh, the employees, that teleworking is much more cost effective. There are so many advantages of it. In some cases, production is up as opposed to working on site somewhere. And I can tell you right now that at Quantico, where I work, uh, the government is talking about uh, all no contractors on base, and that was talked about before the pandemic. But uh, I think the impetus has increased there, and there's so many advantages to people not commuting. So I think overall, you know, percentages set aside, I, who who can predict the percentages? But it's gonna it's gonna happen, and I don't know of any companies that are not considering teleworking. In fact, the Marine Corps is looking at providing teleworking capability for classified network at home. So I think the trend is strong and I don't know what we can do to plan other than discuss it along the way and collect the data as it comes. 
uh, in articles like in the Freelance Star. But I can tell you this, that uh, companies are looking at their bottom line really hard, and it gets better if you're considering teleworking. That's all I have. Thanks, Dave. I, I, this is a great discussion. I, I think what we can do is every document that comes up now, we have a new, whole new fresh perspective to look at the basic assumptions that go into it. Uh, the LRTP chapters one, two, three, and four, when they go out for public comment, we really are going to have a new perspective. Dustin has said some, Al's on some, Dave says it, that are really going to uh, maybe put some people in their ears and say, no, we don't agree with this basic assumption in here. Um, and representing citizens in this area, uh, I think that's a real strong place for us to be able to do that. Um, that, that will, that, you know, really can make a difference. I mean, to talk about a meeting and everything is it, it uh, brings us up to a. I mean, opens our eyes. What uh, what was said earlier uh, surely opened my eyes. Um, so that's good. But I think everything now that comes through, we just can't just kind of oh yeah, the same old assumptions. And what the heck? So we'll, uh, this will be great. I think it's going to be very interesting in the next uh, year or so. Uh, probably two years actually. So. Can, can I jump in real quick about this? Um, just from the higher educational side, yes. um, I know it, our discussions as professors and, and administrators in the higher education is going along the lines of the expectation that there will probably be an initial push back trying to get people to the physical space, but that we're actually going to be starting to train students at the high school level in the college level for things like being able to do the distance work and the telecommuting for the future because after the initial rush of oh great I get to go back you're going to get people saying I was more effective I was more efficient when I was at home and so you're going to start seeing them choosing those those sort of days to, to be able to be home even if it's just once once a week to stay home to get their work done and and as edu in the educational field, we're already talking about how we have to start using our classes to start training the workforce of the future. So two, three, four years down the line, you're gonna have more people coming out of college ready to do the teleworking, knowing how to use the equipment, knowing how to use all the materials, things like Zoom, go to meeting, and all these other things to, to be ready to go with it. So we might actually be seeing it shifting even after the pandemic's over, you're gonna see another year or two where, where we're gonna have more people ready and willing to do that sort of teleworking. Cool, I agree. I mean, this is, this is interesting and exciting. If I may, one more comment yes. on that. Uh, and I, I actually used to work from home fully until December and much to my chagrin, I chose to leave that at the wrong time. Um, but I also, I'm a contractor and I've worked for the government for over a decade and I've been lucky enough to be a one week on, one week off commuting to Fort Belvoir. I was trying to get a job at Quantico here, but that hasn't worked yet. But one thing I think, as you said earlier, representing the citizens, a lot of us here are fortunate enough to work in fields where we can do remote work. But I think as part of the CTEC, one thing we could look at is that not everyone is going to be able to benefit from that and people who do need or rely on public transportation there's going to be a fear or a hesitation to want to you know get on a bus to get on a fret to get on whatever it is with a lot of other people uh, now that people are more conscious about it and I think you know to everyone's point I agree that you know there is great benefit especially from the governmental side to to do more remote stuff to just save overall and maybe those funds could be channeled down through advocation for through people like us to say hey since you're not sending these public or th these public sector jobs to an office channel these funds to the people who need it people who rely on public transportation and with a constraint that is as we all are aware for funding and just there's a limited number of buses or whatever the, the mode of transportation is not everyone can take advantage of the remote work and so maybe thinking about how to serve that portion of the population while it may not be as great in this particular area given the demographics of you know what people do for a living that is something i think we should not forget about there are people that can't work from home that still need public transportation and maybe they don't want to get on it and 
there's not much we can say as this body to say, oh, it's fine, it's safe, get on a bus, right? That's That would be irresponsible. But I think that's something to, to take in consideration that there are people in like, you know, rural areas that don't have good internet access or don't have remote job opportunities that, you know, as we've talked about, you know, expanding these routes in Carolyn and King George, that's something I think maybe we could, it would be, it'd be beneficial if we could say, well, maybe we can shift some of these funds. People aren't on 95 as much. How can we benefit the other people who still need this? I think that's just something that it's a, it's a challenge, but I think that's something to not forget about. I agree. Uh, too bad Rupert isn't here. He'd have some good inputs as well on this. So. Any, anyone else? All right, cool. That was, that was, this is great. This is, uh, us representing citizens and getting our getting our input in there. That's just excellent. Thank you. Uh, staff reports. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, have a couple staff reports tonight. Um, one, like I mentioned earlier, Stacy Fine departed Bampo in early August, and we're in the uh, final stages of trying to fill that position. Um, hope to have it filled next week. Um, Jordan Chandler, since the CTAC last met, was hired as a full-time transportation planner. So congratulations, of course, to Jordan. Um, she's been with our team for almost a year and graduated with her master's degree um, in GIS from Mary Washington in July. Um, we have hired two part-time interns, one of whom you heard from tonight, Mohammed Khan, who just graduated from Indiana University with his bachelor's um, this year and is starting a program in Edinburgh in the UK for uh, city and regional planning this fall. So he'll be with us through the month of December. And then we've also hired Maggie Campbell as a part-time intern. She's an undergrad at UVA studying urban and environmental planning, and she started with us just yesterday. Um, we are, of course, as we have been for some time now, still in the process of hiring uh, the new PAMPO administrator. Um, I am happy to report that we have gotten a number of applications over the last few weeks, and um, Dr. Millsaps and myself are working with the policy committee, their, their executive committee has been tasked with making that hire um, on some next steps. So we've had some screening calls this week with some of the applicants and um, look forward to hopefully getting that filled sooner than later. Uh, Jordan, thank you for your uh, update earlier uh, on the uh, rural LRTP and Muhammad, thank you for your input as well. Uh, Welcome aboard, and we're looking forward to uh, your inputs and, and contributions. Okay, let's do uh, member reports. Uh, anyone in Fredericksburg who uh, needs to make a member report? All right. Okay. Um, somebody's got a hot mic, but I'm not hearing anybody. So how about Spotsylvania, Al and uh, Neil and Stan and everybody? No, this is Nothing to report here. Okay. Yeah, this is Neil. I got nothing either. All right. This is Mel, but I'm, I have nothing to report. All right. Anyone from Caroline County? Hey, Dave. Dave Swan. I had nothing. I didn't come to Stafford County yet. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I heard Melvin. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody from Caroline County? <laughs> All right. Uh, anybody else from Stafford County have anything to report? <laughs> Athelene or I don't think she's on, actually. All right. King George. No report. Okay. And uh, I know that uh, Rupert's not on. I don't think Larry's on either. So Dustin, anything at large? Yeah, Larry's here, but he has nothing. Oh, okay. He is here. Okay, great. We're glad you there are there. Uh, no, I, Dustin has nothing. All right. Thank you. Okay, uh, I, let's see. I need. I guess I need to say a couple things. It seems like um, Adam, um, bet between Leah, it seems like there's really five kind of follow-up actions from this meeting today, um, and it would be in the four probably of maybe one email. But we, we, I would, I would like to 
go out to all the members of, of the committee and say, hey, first of all, if you miss the meeting, you can watch it. It's online. And when it is posted, say it's posted. You can watch it, at, you know, on, on the fan post site here and watch the meeting and, and get caught up. That'd be the first item. The second is um, that um, we would like inputs on the CMAC methodology and either give them a uh, 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 a link to the methodology without you don't have to republish it all in the in an email. We give them maybe a link to that. And say we're looking for inputs on that. We're looking for um, anyone who wants to volunteer to be a C on the repre represent CTAC on the uh, the 2015 LRTP working group. So that's three things. We're looking for branding ideas. And the fifth thing would be the, uh, we're looking for suggestions about upcoming uh, education, uh, education sessions or agenda items for education sessions. I think, I think that's all five that I copied from this meeting. We really would like to get out to all the CTAC members to remind them for their inputs and, and their, uh, their thoughts. Did I miss any that you think about them? I think that's all of them, Dave. No, I know, because I was writing them down. You weren't. Ha ha. So. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. Uh, so thank you for everything. Um, anyway, Mr. Last Mr. Chair, Go ahead. I did have, I did have here um, that Al Durante had asked about um, any kind of data on transit accidents. So that was something that we were going to look that's true yeah yeah i kind of focused on one one meeting one email going out to all and and we like al so we'll, we'll help him all right I, I don't think there's any last minute so uh i would like a someone to move to adjourn the meeting oh wait is somebody talking Let me just open some open mics. Would, would someone uh, move to adjourn the meeting? Dustin Savage moves to adjourn. Anyone second? Second. Thank you. Anybody opposed? Okay, because if you're opposed, you're going to be left behind because we're all leaving the meeting. So we're, adjourned. we're adjourned. Great. Thanks, everybody. Great inputs, uh, great activity uh, and interest. And, yeah, it was a good meeting. Thank you.